Welcome to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I've been wanting to do this kind of video for a while. Since my two focuses for my PhD is environmental history and military history, and more specifically Civil War history, I thought a breakdown of various commanders, not just of the Civil War, but throughout history, would make for some great videos. Before I start, I want to explain that I will be evaluating these men solely on their military capabilities. As you could guess by the title, this video will compare two of the most famous Cavaliers in history, Jeb Stuart and Nathan Bedford Forrest. It would take a video that was two or three hours of in-depth discussion to list all of these men's military accolades. So although some discussions may be brief, I am determined to provide great detail in order to prove the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of each man. Jeb Stewart grew up in Patrick County, Virginia and attended Emory and Henry College and later West Point Military Academy. He would be posted out west fighting Native Americans and be wounded in one of those fights. He was also part of the force that captured John Brown at Harper's Ferry along with Robert E. Lee. When the Civil War broke out, he would join the side of the Confederacy. Nathan Bedford Forrest grew up in Middle and West Tennessee, where he became the sole caretaker of his family after the death of his father when Forrest was 16. He became a businessman, a plantation owner, who owned thousands of acres of land, as well as a slave trader. Through these ventures, he became one of the richest men in the South. When the war broke out, he also joined the Confederate Army. Both men joined the cavalry, and that branch of the military did three things primarily. First, and most likely foremost, they acted as heavily armed scouts who screened the movements of the main army and located the enemy. Second, they were used to raid enemy installations because of their speed. Third, cavalry engaged with enemy infantry, cavalry, and artillery, in many instances dismounted. So let's look at Forrest and Stuart as scouts. Stuart's scouting ability lends itself to his military life on the American frontier. Once he was given command of a substantial amount of cavalry in 1862, his scouting became legendary and Lee depended on it for launching campaigns and smaller attacks. Stuart would essentially create a perimeter around the Army of Northern Virginia that extended for nearly 20 miles outward. If any of the outposts came into contact with the enemy, a series of runners would alert Stuart, who would alert Lee of a breakthrough or provide him with exact coordinates of the enemy. Stuart used this technique most prominently in the fall and winter of 1862 to 63 and in the prelude to the Overland Campaign that Grant launched against Lee. It was in part Stuart's cavalry that directed Longstreet's assault on Union General Pope's army at the Second Battle of Manassas. He screened the First Corps' movements and ensured that Longstreet took the most direct route to the battlefield. Historian Emory Thomas contributes Lee's success to Stuart, and I would have to agree with him. Forrest's scouting ability was not as thorough or intricate as Stuart's. His commanders utilized his ability to raid and engage with the enemy. However, one of the best examples of his scouting ability was when he was in northern Mississippi in early 1864. He spread a small army out across the region to keep the horses on fresh grass and to be able to monitor any Union advances into the area out of Memphis or south from Jackson. However, we do not see the traditional cavalry screening that Stuart performed and was undoubtedly because Forrest's lack of a military background. Nonetheless, this strategy worked, and Forrest could organize his men rapidly in order to make an attack. Stuart's raids have become legendary, especially his ride around McClellan's army on the peninsula in 1862, a feat that has only grown in legend. From June 12th to June 15th, the Virginia Cavalier rode around and through the Army of the Potomac on what Lee called a reconnaissance mission. He took on raid status, though, as Stuart captured 165 prisoners, 260 mules, numerous supplies, and destroyed infrastructure in his 100-mile journey. I would count this as both a raid and a scouting mission. Stuart would ride around and through the Union Army on more than just this one occasion, but this is his most famous. Nathan Bedford Forrest was most known militarily for his ability to raid deep into enemy territory. His moniker, Wizard of the Saddle, lends itself to his ability to appear and disappear throughout a region. Although there are many examples I could point to in order to reflect this ability to raid, I want to focus on his second West Tennessee raid. 
At the end of 1863, he was detached from the Army of Tennessee in order to raise a brigade of troops in West Tennessee and cause havoc there for the Union. Forrest's reputation as a fighter brought men from all over West Tennessee to join Forrest. In a little over a month, he was able to recruit 3,500 men, accumulate much-needed supplies, and round up thousands of hogs and cattle to drive into northern Mississippi to feed his little army, not to mention cutting telegraph lines and destroying infrastructure. How did Stuart fare against enemy cavalry, infantry, or artillery? For starters, he favored mounted attacks and believed in being able to bluff his enemies with cavalry charges. He did this on multiple occasions, especially on his ride around McClellan, but his engagement with the enemy at Brandy Station would highlight one of Stuart's flaws. He underestimated Federal cavalrymen, and that mentality would hurt him in that battle. The Battle of Brandy Station was a turning point for the Union Cavalry. Afterward, they would gain confidence when engaging with Confederate horsemen. The battle was essentially inconclusive. Although the Union withdrew from the field, Stuart came near defeat as the enemy's counterattacks broke his line on many occasions and even surprised the rebels. The bold cavalier did keep the enemy from locating Lee's army as it began the Gettysburg Campaign, but Stuart's overconfidence led to military mistakes. Forrest, on the other hand, dealt successively with armies operating against him. The battle that most exemplifies this is the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, where Forrest defeated a force that outnumbered him three to one. He effectively used deception, making his force look bigger than it actually was, plus using his highly mobile units nearly encircled the enemy. The sudden appearance of the enemy behind them forced the blue troops to retreat or surrender. However, because one of the main focuses of mine is environmental history, I want to point out Forrest's ability to use the environment to his advantage. The battle took place in the heat of the summer in Mississippi. Knowing that the Union cavalry would be a few hours ahead of the infantry, he set about attacking the horsemen, which in turn would make the infantry move more rapidly to the battlefield. Once the infantry made it to the front lines, they, in many cases, were too exhausted to fight. This allowed Forrest to gain an upper hand against a larger enemy. When looking at the two commanders so far, Stuart has an advantage in scouting, Forrest has an advantage in engaging the enemy, and both men were successful raiding in their own right. And if we left it there, I would deem this a draw. However, there is another aspect that needs to be considered, adaptability and innovation. Here is the deciding factor I believe for the two. Forrest displayed great adaptability and innovation as he outmaneuvered and defeated numerically superior armies. Stuart, although he could avoid the enemy when needed, as depicted in his numerous raids, when the Union cavalry advanced in weaponry and tactics, Stuart stuck to his traditional cavalry tactics and displayed a lack of adaptability or innovation. Those are critical for the success of a military commander. Force succeeded against various types of troops and tactics, but Stuart lost his life to a more advanced enemy at Yellow Tavern because he did not adapt to the constantly improving Union cavalry. Do you agree with my assessment? Please comment below whether you agree or disagree and let me know why. These types of videos are always fun to do and I want to do others. Please also comment on which commanders you would like to see me compare. And it doesn't have to be Civil War commanders. It can be commanders from any period. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.